very welcome. This is Wireless Future. I'm Eric Larsson and I'm here as always with my colleague Emil Björnsson. Hello, Emil. Hello, Eric. It's been so a while since we things? were talking. It's been a while indeed. Uh, I think uh, we did have a break yeah. uh, from recording. Uh, life and work came in between, but yeah. now we are back. And uh, I guess people working with uh, 6G research <laughs> in Europe uh, might guess that it could, for example, have to do with all of the uh, yeah calls for big projects that has been oh. the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible indeed. In any case, it feels good to be back in the recording studio and smell the fresh air. Exactly. Studio air. <laughs> and uh, we are planning for a few episodes now before the summer, so this should not be the only one that you will find if you're subscribed to the podcast. Indeed. So today I think ML is episode 29, isn't it? It is. So we are soon approaching 30. That's amazing. 29. That's a prime number. That'll happen less and less uh, frequently, <laughs> I think. <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, I mean, it's it's almost uh, anniversary, right? I mean, mm. uh, and the second anniversary, in fact, uh, approaching us uh, in, in, in the fall this year. Mm. Um, so the intention today is to discuss sixth generation uh, mobile systems, 6G, and specifically to talk about six technologies, or at least say technology trends, that uh, are emerging for 6G. Hmm. Um, so among these trends, Emil, do you have any favorites? I think it's always easy to sort of get stuck in the things that you, you know and look for evolutions of those ones. Hmm. So, so I mean, different kinds of multi-antenna evolutions is what I primarily look at in my everyday research. But then yeah. it's also sort of the thing that... Uh, when MIMO is out there everywhere, we could also use it as a starting platform to do a lot of other things. So that's why there are so many other things now that interest me as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm also sort of a bit of a MIMO guy, right? So <laughs> I tend to think MIMO, distributed MIMO and MIMO in different forms, obviously. But maybe we should start somewhere else today. Hmm? So how about we start to talk about semantic, semantic communications? Hmm? Yeah. Do you want to kick this off? I mean, uh, what is this thing? Yes, exactly. So uh, I was planning to, to say a little bit what it is, and then I think we can discuss what could be the good things and potentially the uh, what would be the potential showstoppers, uh, for example. Oh, yeah. Because, of course, whenever we are working on a new standard with ideas, some things make it into there and some things are not ready enough or doesn't become as promising. So I think for everything that we are working on, it could lead to one of the other cases. But oh. yeah. Semantics. So I guess in general, semantics means that if you have a text, then the words are there, but the meaning of the words is sort of the, the semantics. So if you have a textbook, if you just take all the words and you randomize the order, then you lose the semantics, but the, the content is still there in terms of the words. So what has that to do with communications? Well, typically it's not about only communicating words, but also a meaning. And those meanings should lead to some actions or we would use mm. the communication output for something. And the, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, certainly. But, you know, I mean, why don't you just take this text, right? And you, you compress it mm. using your favorite GZIP or whatever algorithm. And then you, you encode it using your <laughs> favorite channel code and transmit it, right? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the first thing that people say that is working in this research area is that we would like to go beyond what Shannon was proposing with the idea that if you read this first paper from 1948, it says that uh, essentially I don't care about semantics. I just want to have a message. It doesn't matter how we generated it, the message should be transferred to the other side and we should decode it mm. and we are done with it. And mm. then some message here means you start with a, like a finite set, although it might be very large, obviously, mm. but a finite set of messages that you could conceive of and then you pick one of them and then encode it, right? Yeah. And then the design is sort of based on to minimize the risk that we are confusing two messages rather than minimizing the, the risk that we make the wrong decision in the end based on the message that we are getting. Uh, but uh, I think you have a fair point that I mean, within the channel theory, there is all the kind of things about source 
coding where you try to compress the source so it conveys the, the original message but in a condensed manner as possible. And I think the, the semantic communication is meant to go beyond that by compressing things even more to only convey the things that are important for what you want to do. So, uh, if, for example, a, a classical mobile phone, uh, when I was studying sort of signal processing in my master, we talked about that the audio encoder is sort of modeling how the voice sounds like, mm. so what frequencies are used, and then you make a model of a uh, parametric model of that, and you encode the, the audio based on that, and everything that is not mapping with that one, the residual, you are compressing it very hard. So you have a loss in encoding of those things. And, and that is a way of making things more efficient on a statistical level based on that the sounds look like this and that. But uh, I, I think here the idea with semantic communication is to go far beyond that, not only encode the voice, but also think about what is actually said in the voice and, and how should those kind of messages be described in a more efficient manner. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in a way, it's like a very sophisticated form of source coding then, right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so in a way, it, it is... Uh, uh, yeah, it's the source coding and I guess the idea that we should combine this with the communication channel. So, so maybe we should view it as a joint source and channel coding uh, 2.0 or something like that. So that would presumably be data driven in some way. So you'd have some algorithm that learns from experience, right? Uh, not necessarily relying on a, an explicit statistical model like in Shannon theory. Yeah. Is that the reasonable way of thinking of it. I think when you go beyond the, the clean channel theory, the people start to suggest different alternative metrics. And, and what is often boils down to is that, okay, you have the communication channel, and then you have what they call a semantic channel between the transmitter and receiver, where you mm -hmm. everyone have a perception of the world and about the task that we want to achieve. And hopefully those perceptions are, are the same ones so that we can use this uh, pre-knowledge in order to uh, yeah, transfer the meanings more important uh, in a better way. And how would you obtain those things? Were probably through machine learning, as you were saying. Yeah. So is it like I mean, rather than sending across now? I mean, we are recording this through a video call, right? Mm. And I see you in real time on my screen here. But rather than sending this bitstream of video across the system, we just send a string stating something to the effect that, well, here is Emil Bjornsson, and he's like a couple of months older than he was last time we recorded, <laughs> and he's wearing this, but he's wearing the same blue t shirt yeah. that he always does in the podcast. Exactly. <laughs> that would be like 100 bits rather than a million or something, right? Is, is that like yeah. a way of understanding? this vision exactly that could be one way of transferring this type of thing so you have the audio you have the video they are sort of two representation of the same kind of messages and then instead of sending the actual video stream you could perhaps have an avatar of me that is sort of regenerating mm -hmm. uh, the same thing and it's might with <laughs> advanced machine learning <laughs> look uh, yeah, all exactly the same as in the previous podcast. It's just that now my yeah. lips are moving based on a new message, for example. So, uh, right. so I guess so. that is one part of it that you could could imagine. Yeah, I mean it's a cool thing, right? But would it be would this be useful, like in in practice? I mean, is it that the savings in bits here are really important in the end? You think or? What would be like the use cases? Hmm. Why? I mean, if you really ask the question sharply, I guess it's like, who and when would, I mean, who would want and, and when would someone want to pay for this technology, right? Hmm. Um, when would a savings in, in bit load or tra transmission well, bits per second be significant enough that it, it makes a difference. Yeah, and I think this is really the, a valid point when it comes to the the weaknesses here that we need to find this kind of really convincing cases. And in addition to what you said, I think there is also the, the risk that there are so many different tasks we would like to achieve and each one of them would need a different type of semantic encoding and decoding and uh, do we get so many of them that we will have to store a lot of things and we will have to learn a lot of things and eventually the overhead from doing this is sort of removing the benefits from from actually being yeah, efficient. Yeah, and there is also the energy efficiency aspect, right? I mean, maybe you can make a case to you save some, I don't know, 
dual by by, by uh, transmitting fewer bits but then you need to take into consideration how much training that these methods are going to require so you need like tons of data and you need to process all this data so yeah uh, i guess the uh, future will tell right but maybe some convincing applications will emerge yeah and even if you look at the hardware side then well i mean we are using all this kind of uh yeah, source coding methods, for example, for video, there is a number of different standards. And if you agree upon a standard, you can then build a circuit that can hardware accelerate that standard. So it becomes very mm. Uh, mm. efficient to decode the video that you are getting. But uh, yeah, can you do the same thing if you're training everything? Maybe with newer networks and yeah. And, and the last thing, we have been talking for a while about quality of experience, which is to be some kind of metric about how you're perceiving the quality of your communication that goes beyond just how many bits per second are you getting or uh, yeah, what is the mean squared error in your received signal or something like that. And it often boils down to that it's hard to actually optimize this kind of metric. So mm. yeah, I think there are big challenges, but that's also good for researchers. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All right. So where do we go next, Emil? Yeah. Um, so I, I remember that in the previous podcast, I've been talking a lot about distributed and cell-free MIMO. And I was thinking maybe I can ask you this time then. Uh, what is this from your perspective? And yeah. Uh, what would this be yeah, about? Yeah, DMIMO. I mean, so uh, first, I, I mean, we did touch that upon, I think, uh, upon that in, in the podcast in earlier episodes. And in a way, I guess it's maybe a little bit of like your pet and my pet. <laughs> <laughs> but that said, there's also a case to be made. I think that it's the single most important technology for 6G for the physical layer. And um, as the audience probably already knows, DMIMO is all about building like MIMO equipped access points that are distributed uh, could be indoors like in form of antenna panels that sits on the or that sit on the walls or, or the ceiling or some place or it could be outdoors I mean in the form of MIMO access points or base stations on towers or on the facade of buildings or, or integrated into some other structures uh, or, or even like natural objects could be hidden maybe up in a tree somewhere and just made aesthetically so it looks like nobody could really tell, I mean, from a distance at least tell that it's uh, anything artificial or man-made that's put up there. And uh, from the comm theory viewpoint, I mean, the, the, the idea here is that obviously within each one of the, the access points or base stations there are multiple antennas that operate coherently together, face coherently together, but that these different access points that are also spread out geographically that in turn they would also operate face coherently together, right? I mean, is that a fair description, you think, also, Emil? Yeah, or? I think that is a fair description. Then I sort of also get the feeling that didn't we talk about this in... Uh, yeah, like 2008, 9, 10, uh, around that time where I did my PhD, yeah. we also talked about <laughs> sort of distributed MIMO. Then the terms were called network MIMO. Sometimes it were called coordinated multipoint. Yeah. So, so what is the difference here from your perspective? Yeah, so I mean, the idea of making wireless base stations or even wireless MIMO base stations operate face coherently together is absolutely not new right i mean this has been around for at least the 10 years as you suggested i think more yeah. 15 maybe 20 years even um now the reason that modern dmima which is currently being developed will work whereas these like older uh, incarnations of the topic network mimo comp joint transmission uh, I'm sure there are many other names as well. They didn't really work. I think the reasons are twofold, really. Number one is that DMIMO should rely on time division duplexing and reciprocity to get the channel state information. So that means the access point measuring um, uh, uplink pilots sent by the terminals uh, in every uh, coherence blocks, every time the channel has had the chance even of changing substantially the the terminals will will send pilots anew and and these access points will all listen and based on these received pilots they will obtain channel state information which is timely and accurate and that channel state information will in turn be used both for processing of uplink data signals and for beamforming of downlink data signals this is horribly important i mean you know if you think of it if anything 
in the environment. I mean, if, if one of the terminals or any object that contributes significantly to the scattering of the, the radio frequency waves moves more than half a wavelength, then the chance that information is outdated. And, and the key here really to make MIMO in general and DMIMO in particular work is that the network needs accurate channel state information that fa facilitates the use of all these fancy algorithms that we have, right? Like zero forcing beam forming and so forth that shoots power very accurately in space and makes sure to place like spatial nulls where there's supposed to be no interference transmitted and all that. So I think number one is to, to use... Uh, um, to rely on uplink pilots and reciprocity and time division duplexing to, to get accurate channel state information both for the uplink and the downlink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can and comment uh, on that part, uh, then uh, I mean, the, the whole idea, the concept of this, have of course also been around for, for a long time. I think we, when I started working on this, we also had a, the TDD reciprocity in mind. Then uh, th I think the problem has for a long time been that. Yeah, you could do this in TDD, but all the bands we are using is FTD. And then also when it comes to standardization, we want the, the, the system to work the same in TDD and FTD. And then you you can't do it anyway. So it's sort of now mm. with 5G, we have the opportunity and 6G. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, indeed, there, there are like <laughs> spectrum political aspects here, right? That lower bands were allocated for FTD and so forth. I think there is also an, just flat out the pure educational aspect in the sense that now more and more folks realize the superiority of exploiting reciprocity and operating in TDD. And there's been this lingering misconception, I think, in the community that, you know, it will work to use some code books to, to quantize the chance state information and rely on some sort of air quotes line of sight propagation model where, I mean, you know, these textbook cartoons, right, where you see mm. a uniform linear array in free space and then you see beams like nicely drawn, like uh, ellipsoidal kind of shapes. But now the, the thing is, reality doesn't look like that. Not even in the, to start with, m most of the time you aren't even in the, much of the time you might not even be in the far field. But even if you're in the far field, the beams don't look like this because of a vari variety of, of reasons. One is that we'll always have significant multipath and we'll also have like backscattering from structures that hold the antenna, we'll have mutual coupling and all sorts of things. So all these like geometric, textbook cartoonish models of beam, grids of beams and all that are rather poor representations of reality and the simplest and best way of just getting away from that whole paradigm is to say let's just estimate the channel impulse response unstructured relying on, on uplink pilots and then we measure these we make sure that we have good enough signal to noise ratio on these pilots and we make sure that we have li little enough like contamination on the pilot channels which means like don't reuse the pilots too often and so forth and then measure these channel responses and just use them without imposing like any prior assumptions from some <laughs> well textbook model on what the linear array looks like or anything right yeah yeah and so, the dangerous thing yeah. <laughs> there is that there are certain cases of course like one user a very line of sight dominant millimeter wave channel where these textbook things are accurate but as soon as you are trying to serve multiple users and you have a more complex scenario then it oh, breaks yeah. down so it's sort of dangerous when yeah, you certainly. just make measurements and design things for the simplest case mm -hmm. and then it doesn't work in other cases no no certainly <laughs> i mean if you t if you take a uniform linear array constructed the right way you put it in an, an echoic chamber and then you make sure you are in the far field and measure you'll see pretty much this textbook uh, Monde array response right there's no there's no question but the point is the reality is very much different from <laughs> what you get in this anechoic chamber with highly calibrated uh, um, um, and, and so forth yeah um but but back to your yeah, i think you had the second like, uh, second uh, main point, thing yes right? no i think the second point is also the the fact that Modern DMIM will rely on, on an excess of service antennas over the number of data streams that are multiplexed simultaneously or over the number of like terminals that we serve at the same time, right? Um, which gives us, in a way, it's like, well, we have, because of all the service antennas that we have at, at, at all the access points collectively taken, right? they will offer us so many spatial degrees of freedom, so many ways that we can form a beam from an access point over here and uh, another beam from an access point over somewhere else. And we can adjust these in phase so that they combine in a certain way and so forth. Um, and this, 
abundance of degrees of freedom that we have in the spatial beam forming also makes it possible to accurately null out the interference and and um, I think that's really a second thing here. I mean, it's a little bit like in convention or let's say conventional or co-located massive MIMO, right? We, one of the reasons that co-located cellular massive MIMO is so great is that we have a lot of spatial degrees of freedom to play with that can be used to null out the interference and so forth. And and the same will go for modern D MIMO where um, I mean, it, it it's like a massive MIMO system. It's just that the antennas are spread out over a larger geographical area, so that, um, well, obviously yeah. the, the the path gains and or the path losses. I mean, from from a terminal will won't be the same, right? To to to, um, to different access points and so forth. Yeah, and I think here you have one of the the main differences then when it comes to coordinated multipoint, which was already introduced in 4G as the idea of having the conventional big base station and let the col- the neighboring ones collaborate. But here we, the antennas are actually spread out. We don't start from a cellular network perspective. Uh, but uh, okay, so if you want to find then what are the weaknesses? So what is the main challenges to make this actually be practical? Yeah. Weakness, I don't quite see any, to be honest, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> challenges, certainly. I mean, many of the challenges are on the implementation, right? How, how, how I actually build the electronics, which, of course, entails also uh, challenges on the algorithmic level. Like, now there's a lot of signal processing that will have to be done here. Where should the signal processing be, be performed, right? Should it be done at the actual access points or panels, or should it be done in some kind of central location and you could envision having very lightweight antenna panels and then you have fiber optic cables and to, to some central processing unit big as a fridge where you have um, virtually unlimited uh, with DSPs or, or, or other circuitry that can do the job and on the algorithmic level I mean much of the challenge is like so how do we distribute the signal processing without losing too much in performance or losing it all in performance. For example, if you want to compute the optimum, let's say, zero forcing beamformer or MMSE beamformer, can this be done then um, by splitting the computational load over the the uh, access points in, in a reasonable way and connected to that is also the issue of delays on uh, or latency. Because if you distribute processing, then that means that maybe some access point has to finish the job and then forward his like data to the next access point, and, and, and that access point needs to process his data and jointly with whatever he got from the other, and then forward to the next and so forth. And now, if traffic is delay critical and you have a hundred access points, then <laughs> this might be a big deal. Um, in, in fact, so that, that that's certainly a challenge. I mean, just managing the complexity, right? Um, I, I, I think another challenge is uh, also on maintaining phase synchronicity. I mean, on uplink, that's not an issue because on uplink, you have two panels, even if they are out of phase relative to each other, the uplink data signal and the uplink pilot will undergo exactly the same uh, phase rotation. But on downlink, they have to be aligned in phase for joint beam forming to, to work. So protocols for that need to be um, developed. And uh, what more? Energy efficiency, um, obviously, is a thing, right? I mean, we can't afford, we won't be willing to build, and maybe nobody will be willing to buy <laughs> uh, antenna panels that consume hundreds of watts of power. And we need to make sure that, I mean, they are power efficient or energy efficient, both when they operate. At, at full speed, but also in idle mode. I mean, much of the time networks are likely to still be in idle mode and you might have a few terminals to wake up now and then just to send a few bits and then you you, you don't want the network components themselves to just go idle and burn a lot of electricity. So yeah. um, these are algorithmic and electronics challenges to a large extent. I'm sure I missed a lot of other uh, I, I guess uh, one uh, one more practical concern could of course be that uh, uh, yeah you would like to have antennas everywhere ideally but it's costly and it uh, is uh, 
something that uh, might be hard from a practical perspective who owns things who should put out the equipment and all these type of things but yeah i think i agree that this might be one of the 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 closest things to materialize uh, among the things we should talk about yeah indeed i think i mean you're touching upon like challenges here that are more connected to regulatory constraints and ownership of equipment and for and, uh, ownership i mean who, who, who's gonna put this panel up there and who, who where who high where's the cable to it going to be hidden and so forth and who will pay for the um, <laughs> i don't know <laughs> whoever needs to um, actually go there right and install it and but, but those are really not technological challenges I mean there's nothing in the laws of nature here that are against us and then we need to fight right it's more like a matter of deciding and, and establishing the, the the right and the appropriate regulatory frameworks I think yeah to, so we will eventually take steps in that yeah. direction at least yeah yeah so yeah should we take the next one perhaps um Maybe we should. So why don't we stay with, uh, let's say, maybe something closely related to MIMO, but still different from MIMO, right? So reconfigurable intelligence surfaces, Emil, or I think RIS or RICE, RIS, I think. Yeah, Is I think people say often RIS now, then it's also the intelligent uh, reflecting surfaces name, IRS. Then IRS is also a tax office in the US. So I think RIS sounds better <laughs> to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so RIS stands for reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. But IRS stands for intelligent reflecting surfaces. Is that right? Because I thought that in the early days, I mean, when, when, when this vision was like emerged and people talked about reflecting the wave, but then more and more folks realized that, well, these small surfaces aren't really going to reflect. They will more like scatter and therefore it's better to call it reconfigurable. I don't really know. Yeah, I, I, I think that also comes down to semantics in the sense that I think the word reflection, there is also, you can call diffuse reflection yeah, and so specular reflection and then everything is reflection. So. Yeah, absolutely, it's a form of, I mean, if you think of a small metallic plate or like an atom in this re-surface, then it what it does is like diffractive reflection or sc scattering right but but it's not like a, i mean it, it's hardly a mirror i think that's the point yeah but yeah uh, so yeah well, yeah is this is the i mean is this 6g so, Reese? Uh, so i think the the best selling point of this technology is the following that uh, so we have built systems in the past that are design in the transmitter and the receiver very nicely. Now we have MIMO arrays at transmitter and at the receiver we can do all of the cool things. We have abundance of spectrum and things like that. But in between them there is the, the rest of the world and we need to sort of do the best out of that that is given to us. And now mm. the then idea is that what if we put up equipment that give us some kind of controllability of the uh, propagation environment. If we then start looking at, or oh, you have the protocol stack with layer one being the physical layer, layer two being the medium access and so on, then mm. maybe there is something on layer zero below the physical world that you can control and engineer. And that will then provide us with a new design dimension where that we haven't that's a fascinating before. thought but i mean a, a more basic question here is like so why don't we consider this when we choose building like material construction materials for buildings right i mm -hmm. mean rather than having um, i don't know covering the walls with uh, or building walls from like reinforced concrete or something we would like embed some other metallic kind of structure or something that would like scatter or reflect the waves in such a way that the radio propagation in the room i'm not saying this is even possible but i mean the kind of the way of thinking right um yeah i mean we are doing this uh, <laughs> all the time I mean, i'm sitting here in a room with uh, white walls and what why do we have white walls because it reflects the the sunlight or the other lights in a better way so it looks brighter and the same kind of thing of course you can choose how you are painting things what material you're using we are already selecting where we put up base stations to get good coverage but that is sort of a uh, yeah design of the layer zero so to say before uh, we are using the network but reconfiguring things online that is sort of the, the new thing 
Uh, and then the idea is then, okay, you need to have some equipment that can do this. So you put up this RIS and it, the, maybe the simplest way of viewing it is that, yeah, I, I brought with me a small piece of aluminium here. Oh, and foil, uh, wow. of course, uh, <laughs> aluminium foil here will reflect the light. And if you are uh, rotating it, the light will be reflected in different ways. And what you also can do is you can bend it and then you will reflect in other ways and sort of a, uh, if something is bended, well then you can focus signals at a particular point instead of reflecting in a particular direction, for example, or scattering, whatever we want to call it. Mm. Uh, then what is a RIS doing? Well, it do exactly the same thing. It's just that it's electronic. So you don't bend the surface, you just change its properties at some smaller level. So it's not uh, homogeneous anymore, it's heterogeneous, so that way you control it. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of work showing now that, okay, we can do this. So, mm. Yeah, it's a cool technology. I mean, uh, my reservation is rather that now the reconfigurability itself will require considerable amounts of like electronics that will have to be powered and built and so forth. And now we're going to build all this electronics, deploy it and, and, and power it through the grid. Why not just put up a small access point or something else instead, right? Yeah, and I think this um, is sort of one of the, the, the main concerns here that, uh, okay, we get this new design dimension. That is cool from an engineering perspective. What should we use it for? And then if we are focusing on power boosting the received signal, uh, then, as you, you were saying, there are alternative technologies, relays, small cells, other kinds of things you could put up. And uh, in many cases, uh, if you are, for example, transmitting a millimeter wave signal along a street, and then there is a, a cross section, and you want the signal to enter into the neighboring street or perpendicular one, well, then a reflecting surface could help you with that. But it doesn't necessarily need to be reconfigurable because the street is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but then we are back where we started, right? Where I suggested you could just put up some small pieces of aluminum foil at random to improve, like just like you have a, a light colored wallpaper because you like the room to be <laughs> yeah. brighter. So, so, so uh, I think uh, there. There, people have been focusing a lot on this research in recent years. Some of the first uh, big papers have more than a thousand citations. And I feel that we are sometimes getting stuck in to that this is only about power boosting signals or, or making smaller changes. I think we need to think more about what could we do that would be more fundamentally different. And then, the, uh, yeah, there is still... Uh, a lot to, to be done around that to really prove that there are good use cases for this mm -hmm. new design dimension. One thing might be that we would try to, uh, if you have a MIMO uh, transmitter and MIMO receiver, there are many cases where you observe more signal dimensions than the actual strong paths of your channel. So can you use these surfaces to add new strong paths that you are tweaking so that they become really distinguishable? And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there could be other things like... Uh, uh, dealing with uh, fading by making the channel get uh, hardened to some extent, or you can try to hide Doppler effects. and uh, So there are some more uh, yeah, deeper kind of changes you can do uh, to the channels, for example. Mm. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, uh, rather than building a wreath of some certain size like this with small atoms or whatever, I mean, there's nothing in, in principle that prevents you from like distributing these small atoms and just putting like small scattering objects all over the place and those could be just fixed up there or they could be reconfigurable in some way so i'm not saying there would be like necessarily any or even conceivably any advantage to to doing it but one could distribute the atoms in the reese and <laughs> just have like small possibly or potentially controllable scatterers placed uh, all over the space also yeah, yeah. And, and of course uh, it's one thing that you can control them. That's the next thing you need to have a means of doing it. And uh, for doing that, you probably need to have an RF chain there so that you can talk to it from a base station, tell, please change the configuration. And then all of a sudden, uh, it is like a uh, there is an RF chain plus a big surface. Yeah, 
plus electronics to power the yeah. whole thing so then you know why don't you just put a small relay up there <laughs> uh, uh, yeah so, so so i think that is why uh, what the relay will do is primarily to to boost power so that's why i think we need to look beyond that and search for, for those type of use cases for this to be truly useful yeah, but a relay, I mean, a distributed MIMO relay could also improve like sure. the rank of the sure. channel, right? So, and, and that's indeed a technology that maybe we won't talk about today, but which has, which isn't really conceptually new at all, but which people haven't talked so much about maybe for the last years, but distributed MIMO relaying uh, could really be also something to to look at more more in detail i think i mean of course the challenge there is like the face sync and all that but maybe that's something we say for the future yeah <laughs> so there's a final i mean this this one use case for reese that i find rather compelling though mm-hmm. potentially and that is as a way of building a mimo transmitter like rather than building like a massive MIMO array or panel, you'd build like well a single antenna RF transmitter, and then you would put it in the near field of a RIS and use the RIS to control. Of course, you could only like serve a single spatial stream or terminal at the same time, right? But you could steer the beam maybe by controlling the weights, which is a an advanced form of what was known as a parasitic antenna many years ago. Yeah. So it isn't like a new thing really, but maybe the technology development that has happened in the field of RIS in the last years could could facilitate building that type of, of transmitters. Uh, I would imagine that could be really useful at especially a high frequency bands, right? Where it's hard to build coherent MIMO arrays. Exactly. And there, I think there are much more commercialized kind of solutions. Uh, I'm not sure if they are separated like that or if it's like the, uh, it's more like a meta surface with a transmitter at the back side of a surface. But uh, yeah, there are uh, the, the companies P- Pivotal Comware have something they call holographic beamforming, which is a, a solution built a little bit like that. I think there is QMeta that's building some kind of uh, yeah, satellite transceivers. Uh, so so yeah, I, yeah. I, I think the, 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 the more challenging part of the cases is when you have this big separation between the transmitter and surface. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess one of the the features of RIS compared to many types of relays is what we call the full duplex operation. It transmits and receives the signals or retransmits at the same time. So so let's shift over to full duplex communications in general. What mm-hmm. What is this? Is this a big new thing yeah full duplex it's kind of fascinating thing right you'd build a a, a, just radio transceiver they could transmit and receive at the same time so then the question is how is this accomplished well with a single antenna it could be accomplished you need a circulator that splits the outgoing wave from the incoming wave and so forth or you could have a, a configuration with two antennas very closely located to to one another and and use one to transmit and the other to receive in, in either case, you'd on the receive path get substantial self-interference from the transmitted wave, which needs to be cancelled. And, and there is technology for this. I mean, it's quite mm. fascinating, right? This is analog filters and stuff that can be used, but also digital processing um, circuits that can essentially it's like an echo canceller, but you need a very high dynamic range in the circuitry here because you could have like <laughs> that... that, that the self-interference would be so much stronger than the, the incoming wave that you're really interested in. So you need enormously high dyna- dynamic range. I think a combination of mm. both here. I mean, you'd need, you need also digital cancellation techniques that deal with residuals. Um, so it's a fascinating technology. And I think from a 6G perspective, the question is really like, now, suppose that we could build, and we can build, and folks have demonstrated this in, in, in labs, right? But suppose that we could build this like at a reasonable cost and so forth, and would it be useful to have in 6G like access points? And in a way, I think the answer would be yes, because suppose you, I mean, this is a thought experiment. Suppose we could get this for free, right? Yeah, so it's nice to have. I mean, look, we have full duplex. Maybe we can do something useful with it, and maybe in the first generation of the 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 product it'll just sit there as an uh, unused but then there'll be a software update suddenly where somebody figures out a good way of like using it so certainly it's it's a fascinating thing i believe but 
in the end, the question is also how much could one eventually gain? It isn't so obvious. I mean, now if you transmit and receive at the same time as a poster compared to as a regular TDD transmit or uh, transmit, listen or receive, transmit, receive and so forth. And with full duplex, if you transmit all the time, you would like emit twice as much interference under a peak power constraint at least. What are the consequences of that in a system perspective? I don't know. Um, I guess you, you can ideally double the data rate, assuming that you need the same data in the uplink and the downlink. Yeah, yeah in principle, but what happens to interference and so forth, right? I mean, so, so this mm, is sometimes my, my concern here. If I, yeah. I understood it correctly, uh, you because of being able to cancel interference, you need to have a few antennas for transmit and a few antennas for receive. So if you sort of double the number of antennas to double the data rate minus interference, you could perhaps double the the data rate with those two antennas, but do some MIMO stuff for. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, we got an antenna here and it, we're on TDD, so transmit, receive, transmit, receive, right? Okay, so now let's make this full duplex. And now we might need another antenna that... Uh, one that transmits and one that receives and then we suddenly we have two antennas so the baseline for comparison is no longer the, the nominal system with a single antenna but it's rather a MIMO system with two antennas in TDD right which we know can be used to beam form and so forth so hmm. um, I, I guess I have to really pass on the question as to whether there are any compelling system studies that show appreciable gains here you, you, assuming say that state of the art technology which is now available and built in prototype form in the lab could be commercially deployed in a wide scale at, 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 at low cost. Um, I, I do think there is one really exciting use case though which is uniquely facilitated if by full duplex if it mm -hmm. could be built and deployed and, and, and that is if you think of reciprocity based beam forming in TDD right the way that works is that Pilots, no, I mean terminals, the, the and, and access points take turns, right? So terminal transmits an uplink, pilots and data, and then the the access point beamforms back on downlink. But when beamforming back on downlink, then the access point will use channel state information, which was learned from the uplink pilots, uh, and those pilots came a little while ago, like half a slot back or so in time. But with full duplex, it could in principle be possible for the terminal to transmit uplink pilots simultaneously as the downlink beam forming is taking place. So that channel state information is, is not even slightly outdated, <laughs> or at least less outdated than in, in traditional uh, TDD. Hmm. So that I feel like is a really exciting thing that could be that could be a deal breaker. I mean, in, in high mobility, high carriers, right? Hmm. So, yeah, and, and, and I guess uh, my suggestion there with uh, you can double number of antennas to double the data rate. What that really entails is that you would probably uh, need to uh, double the number of users that you're serving. So it might be more relevant if yeah. you have a large number of users compared to if you really want to increase the data rate for one device, then this is sort of one of the, the ways of actually sending twice the number of signals back and forth to it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So where do we go next, Emil? Uh, we, we did have a couple of more topics, I think, on the list that we had planned to talk mm -hmm. about. And maybe the next one. Um, is joint communications and sensing, which is, I think, is fair to say, a fairly large and, as it seems to me, growing topic of research. So what is this all about? So in a way, the communication and sensing in the terms of like, uh, yeah, localization of objects or radar, things like this. These have been two different types of systems that have been developed alongside and shared a lot of, of kind of ideas. So, so, I mean, from the multi-antenna perspective, I think a lot of the people that started to work in that with communication 
came up with the ideas from from radar community for example uh, and mm-hmm. when we are now sort of motivated by communications are building these advanced systems they have a lot of antennas so they can resolve signals uh, in angles different directions uh, whatever uh, way we do it uh, we have a lot of spectrum uh, which is sort of making us possible to sample signals quickly and see small changes. We have a wavelength that, that becomes shorter and shorter, and that also gives us a, a better kind of resolution. So, so then the, uh, I think the general thought there is that, well, if we are building these systems anyway for communications, can't we use it also to sense our environment? And mm. what would that be? Well, it could just sense that things are moving around, someone's coming close to a base station, or localize objects, or yeah, do all kinds of, of sensing tasks. Mm-hmm. But 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 that's clear, right? I mean, just the sheer amount of baseband data that we have with all these MIMO arrays and so forth, that, that that all the data could be used for 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 something else than only communicating. I mean, with sense this is already out there, right? I mean, mm. you, for example, classical example is to use, to use um, Wi-Fi or rather the impulse responses measured by the Wi-Fi access points to sense whether something is going on. Are there people in the room? Has somebody fallen uh, on the floor or <laughs> something like that happened, right? Um, so granted, now with all this baseband data that will be available from all these MIMO arrays and so forth, then that data could also be used for inference about what's going on in the environment. But I thought that this the notion of joint sensing communication is rather like a way of looking at so how could we design like waveforms that carry information but at the same time are also useful for active sensing um, of the environment so that an access point would act not only to communicate with terminals but also as a radar <laughs> more or less is that, is that a correct understanding of what is joint sensing and communication this means? is sort of what, what the research and is going uh, towards so if you sort of come for free that we could use the communication infrastructure also for sensing then what kind of changes should we do to how we're operating it uh, mm-hmm. in order to, to do the sensing better and better and and I think an important thing there to to bear in mind is that there are fundamental differences from what kind of waveforms we would like to have in communications and sensing. So in communication, we want them to sort of be, be bandwidth efficient. We try to, to sort of use something that resembles sync pulses in the time domain, which spreads out a lot in time, so that they are very confined in frequency. While uh, in uh, a sensing systems, you prefer to have something that have very narrow time uh, dimension so you can see you can send a pulse it bounces of an object and then you can see precisely when it comes back because it the uh, the pulse is very short and that then spreads out a lot in, in frequency so so that is sort of showing why different types of waveforms are generally preferred for communication and sensing yeah but I thought that a signal used for communications should in general look like white noise more or less right isn't that what you get i mean if you take a message and you you encode it using a random channel code and and so modulate it and so forth and you get something that resembles white noise if you look at mm-hmm. the spectrum it's kind of like even the power of spectral density is evenly or, or almost constant over frequency right you want to spread over as large a bandwidth as possible, I think, because bandwidth is almost al- always more worth than power in communications, right? So a signal which is good for communications should look like white noise and be spread over a large bandwidth, I would argue. And then we know from radar that, or time delay estimation that a signal which is good for like range estimation, well, it should have a peak autocorrelation function, uh, which means that its spectrum should be <laughs> should be also flat. And the width of the peak in the time domain is inversely proportional to the the bandwidth. So it, it does seem to me that signals that are good for communications are also good for at least for ranging and vice mm. over range estimation and vice versa. But then of course you could argue like in the spatial domain that maybe a signal 
that's good for communications well that should be directed towards the receiver right using some beam forming whereas a signal used to sense the environment maybe should be more omnidirectional or should explore some part of the space where we have less information and so on so i can absolutely see that there is a trade-off involved here i mean the, the general thing there is that okay you have a transmitter sending out the signal the signal bounces over different objects and then you have a receiver that picks up the signal and in the the monostatic mode this is sort of at the same location and then maybe you're using full duplex as you were talking about before or in the bi-static case the transmit and receiver are different arrays at different locations and and then from the communication perspective sort of you estimate a channel and the important thing is that you estimate your channel taps and you don't care about if these were multiple objects or not or whether your your sort of pulse shape to, to use is mm. mixing up different types mm. of, <laughs> of, of multipaths or not well for the sensing you will like to, to be able to separate them uh, better and better and, and that then you want to get more semantics out of the, the channel <laughs> and not only measure the, the yeah components of it <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I, well, I, I can, of course, also see that there are system optimization aspects here. Like, well, suppose that some base day or some access point wants to sense very accurately the environment, and there might be an advantage to other access points in the vicinity to uh, shut down temporarily to not create any interference at all. I mean, in, in communications, we very often we can bear with the interference it's just there right and we adapt our modulation and coding and so forth to live with it um, but maybe with sensing if you really want some high resolution data then it's like yeah now it's my turn to sense please <laughs> be silent for a millisecond or something so certainly i can absolutely see there are many new problems here to to uh, to address and um, yeah, and then there are a few different aspects of this. To, to, on the one hand, it's sort of okay, it comes for free that we can do some sensing as well. Then, uh, yeah, to some extent, we can already do sensing with the sins we have. And you were mentioning that it can already be done. So I think some of the effort is sort of, yeah, should we change our standards in order to make the sensing perform better? And then if we do that, then is this something that will only be used by the network operator to improve its own service inside the its network or is it meant to sell other types of services to try to monetize on it and and if that yeah if that is the goal then we have this general problem that most of the time when network operators try to control what services people are using in the end it's some over the top service that is uh, is winning the game like google or apple or facebook or someone mm. yeah. and uh, yeah yeah indeed i mean the equipment is already there right so now we got these mimo panels then well it's is neat we can use them to be inform and communicate and all that but indeed we could also use them as a bi-static radar <laughs> and we get that capability for free right and um, for one thing we could use the reuse just the baseband data from the communication link to make inference about the environment but we could also design radar like signals designed to to probe the environment actively and uh, again the equipment is already there so this functionality would be an extra piece of software and algorithms, more or less. Yeah, it's a it's it's a cool um, prospect. I yeah. Think. Then a final non-technical thing is also that if people that are not understanding wireless technology very much are already concerned about uh, yeah radiations levels and uh, yeah privacy and these type of things then if we start to say oh now we have a network that can sense everything they are essentially spying on what you're doing they, they know where you are then that could also sort of be uh, <laughs> yeah another yeah, kind of but, issue <laughs> uh, I, I certainly think it is an issue and uh you know, let's not underestimate the amount of information that's contained in all these basement data. Just even just the channel impulse responses, they tell a lot about who is at home in the house, what are they doing, who is maybe on the street or something like that. So maybe, maybe that's a topic we should return to at some point. Yeah, no, exactly. Even if you are uh, making sure the data such is very well, uh, yeah. Um, 
pri- have good privacy through coding, then you can still find other information about you. Okay, so maybe we should uh, take the, the last thing we were going to talk about. So orbital yes. angular momentum or OAM. What is that? Orbital angular momentum. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> where do we start? Is this 6G? Probably not. But let's see what we can uh, say about yeah, it. Yeah, so, I think there are some people who really say this is uh, such a new uh, dimension for 6G. <laughs> so I'm curious to hear your take. <laughs> yeah, so my take is that there was a lot of buzz about orbital angular momentum or OAM I think about 10 years ago and when you read papers and you'll see claims like well this is a new type of radio technology that generates helical wave fronts or face fronts and that have a singularity along the uh, the, the axial direction and so forth and when you just look at this it's like wow here is something new that we haven't understood what is it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'll tell you the first time I was exposed to it, I was like, wow, what is this? This is some kind of new quantum phenomena or something that we just haven't captured before, right? I mean, I was living like in the world of Maxwell's equations where we have electric magnetic field and then we have these pro- different modes of propagation in the waveguide and we have these different like polarizations in, in free space and all that. But it's certainly not. I mean, and, and, and this is well known and understood by now, despite the bus that was there like 10 years ago. And it was really a bus. I mean, in the scientific literature, uh, there was a bus about it. And there was in the media also, the BBC made a story, uh, I think, entitled something like Twisted Radio Waves Will uh, Boost Capacity of Wireless Communications and so forth. And But the thing is that, OAM is nothing else than conventional point-to-point MIMO, or rather what you get with conventional point-to-point MIMO when you have accurate enough channel state information at the transmitter so that you can do the textbook stuff, I mean the the SVD or water filling, like beamforming and all that. There is nothing here that goes even um, an inch beyond I mean <laughs> classical electromagnetics and this is important to understand I think and I, I you know I have to tell you that you know you look at because there are some papers in physics right physical I think review letters that very highly cited papers and I I kind of got a little bit of, of, of a hit down here because I used to think I mean granted in there's a lot of nonsense, unfortunately, published in IEEE journals, right? But I used to think that, like, physics, that's <laughs> natural science, so clean that, <laughs> I mean, these papers are, like, of, of a different, like, le- level somehow. But then you see these kind of things, and then you really kind of changes your worldview almost a little bit. <laughs> so... Uh, I think the, the, the short answer is there's nothing new here at all. This is point-to-point MIMO, properly optimized. And this is well understood. I mean, uh, there, there's a paper that I can uh, warmly recommend by a colleague uh, over Edfors uh, with a co-author. I can't remember his name. Yeah, we can sh- share it, it in the description uh, of the episode. Share, uh, yeah, episode. That uh, neatly outlines more technically what I just now said, right? And uh, I, I think it's important for people to understand that there, there, there's really nothing here. I mean, in terms of... Well, there are certainly questions in terms of let's do point to point MIMO how do we best optimize the geometry of the array right I mean there's no reason why a MIMO array should be uniform linear with half a wavelength spacing or rectangular with half a wavelength spacing or anything like that this is a a gross misconception that well it's easy to do the some of the math in line free space line of sight so you find it in textbooks but there is no reason in practice what it would look like that indeed so, so certainly, I mean, the array geometry and topology could be optimized using proper electromagnetic models. Uh, but once that's been done, and once we have the sta- everything on the standard form, the standard model, and we account for mutual coupling, and so far that's a significant effect, and so on, and we make sure to get channel state information where we need it accurately enough, then OAM is just an, in- an instance of point-to-point MIMO. Yeah, <laughs> so. So, so my t- 
take uh, on this is sort of that okay if you take two uh, arrays of antennas they probably can have any shape of them and then you put them very far from each other in free space then there will only be one uh, way of transmitting that reaches them and that is then this te textbook kind of beam then you move them closer to each other and you are coming closer than the Fraunhofer distance and you so you're in the radiative near field and now uh, you can all of a sudden transmit multiple signals between them in a point-to-point -point mode and and then the geometry of the arrays determines how those signals actually look like and from a communication Absolutely. perspective I mean, it doesn't if, matter. If you look at OAM, <laughs> yeah, I mean if you look at the literature in OAM you'll find illustrations, very beautiful color picture of beam patterns, right? It looks like exotic flowers or something and, and, and these are, I mean, entirely accurate. This is what you get with point-to-point -point MIMO. Yeah. Once you're in the near field of your array and once the array isn't any longer like lambda half spaced uniform and, and, and linear and so forth. Yeah, so. I think in OEM they are using circular arrays that they are pointing towards each other and then you happen to get this kind of beam shape so it's not really beams anymore and if you pay, take some other well, structure... that can be debated, what does a beam yeah, exactly. mean, right? I yeah. mean, but if a beam means something shaped uh, like some kind of oval or <laughs> then uh, but, but, but certainly you get radiation patterns, right? And you can you can compute them and you can optimize them and it's... No. No, but, really? uh, and with the same number of antennas as you would need in, in OEM, you can put them in another sh uh, way, you will be able to get the same capacity, it just will look different physically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly like that. So. Okay, so then we have addressed that <laughs> right. point as well. <laughs> we did. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think we did cover the um, six. Yeah, uh, we covered all of them. trends, or oh, well, not all. I mean, we co covered let's say six of these, all the six G technologies and trends that are out there, right? And uh, that was a fun discussion, Emil. Yeah, and I think when we were preparing, we we were having a few more ideas, uh, but. Uh, that wasn't six more. So if anyone who is listening have ideas about things they think we should talk about in the same kind of way, then we'd be happy to, to get your, your suggestions. So please comment on the YouTube version of this mm. podcast. Oh, absolutely. As always, we, um, uh, we, we always welcome uh, comments and questions on the, on, on the podcast. So. Good, Emil. Done. Yeah. See you next time. Yes. Have a nice day.